Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Proud to be here with you every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern time here on the broadcast. Always having fun on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora and always appreciating the conversation. Coming up this week, we have the ingredients to success, as we always do on every Tuesday show to round out the Tuesday broadcast around 10.50 a.m. Eastern Time. Proudly brought to you by Utica Pizza Company, and it's a Utica thing. You can see our new Two Guidos in a Kitchen show. We do two, we, we, the, the name of our video series is Two Guidos in a Kitchen. It's Phil Russo and myself, Dan Tortora. little comedy off of a word that us Italians don't always like, so we turn it into a positive, make it funny. Two Guidos in the Kitchen is our video series. We just have a new in, we we just ushered in a new installment, and you can watch that. We talk about Syracuse sports while making veal mushroom stew inside of the kitchen of Utica Pizza Company. Definitely want to check that out for some good laughs, good conversation, and food that will make you extremely hungry. So, if you're going to watch it, make sure you're close enough to 628. South Main Street in North Syracuse to get to Utica Beats Company today. So with that being said, that's coming up on Tuesday. On Wednesday's show at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, we always have Coach Q join us live on the broadcast. Coach Q, the head women's basketball head coach for Syracuse University. He joins us every Wednesday at 10.30. He'll be joining us this Wednesday as well. And on Thursday, Papa Joe's picks that we do throughout college football in the NFL season He will be with us for a few more episodes here as we finish up college football talk and obviously the NFL season. So Papa Joe will be joining us this Thursday. And, of course, we'll look to have Katie Kalinske come back on to the broadcast. She's had a very, very busy schedule as the director of basketball ops for Buffalo's women's basketball team and doing a tremendous job over there, I am sure. And we look forward to having her back. We'll do Fantasy Football Power Hour, where we'll speak on the NFL moves, transactions, any coaching changes, as well as the upcoming championship games with Mike Sofka of Hall of Fame Fantasy Football.com. And then on Friday's show, we'll do the annoying moment of the week, significant sound bites. And then in the second hour of the show, you'll be live in studio on video with us because on Fridays, you can watch Wake Up Call simultaneously as listening every Friday. I open up the studio to you on video on Facebook Live on Facebook.com backslash Live Now DT. So you can check us out there as well, and I I implore you to do so, and I thank everybody that has taken some time to watch us and hang out with us on video as well. Our videos are doing tremendous, tremendous work on YouTube and on Facebook. So if you go to YouTube.com backslash DT. Facebook.com backslash wake up call DT or Facebook.com backslash live now DT. You'll be able to watch all the videos that we've done, including our Friday morning in studio videos. So make sure that you check those out and have some fun with us on Facebook and YouTube because we definitely have been having a uh, wonderful time and we've been having uh, things have just been going very, very well with our videos. And that's because of you. It's something that we've done more and more over the past year. I can say that that's one of the places that Wake Up Call has really grown the most is in our videos in 2018. So I want to thank you for watching them and being a part of them, however we've done them, and, and whether they've been live or or you know sent out to you as part of a package of coverage of something like when I went down and covered the Camping World Bowl and whatnot. I just thank you for spending some time with our videos and, and having some fun with it. We have been able to shoot videos for Utica Pizza Company and uh, K9 Campground Dog Boarding, as well as the upcoming K9 Doggy Daycare one that we're going to show you with a dog that was actually utilized in a movie recently. So we get to share that and uh, and have a nice special guest. And then we have uh, you know video coming up with Jim Rasikowski as they approach their one year anniversary at Chick Fil A Cicero. So a lot of great things. And true by Hilton Camillus, we do the Top at Breakfast Bar in our in our newest video, and we. Had a really good time with that, and I had the opportunity to eat the food, which is <laughs> which is always that's a great part of when I do food shows, as I always get to taste test. And you know, the companies that I work with, their food is wonderful. So I'm very excited about sharing that with you and and having some fun with you as we move forward here. So definitely make sure that you're you're hanging out with Wake Up Call with Dan Tatora, and you're watching our videos. And once again, a big thanks to everybody that has 
that has watched the uh, the videos that we've put up already and and had some fun with us. So thank you for that. Talking Syracuse basketball in this part of the broadcast. Uh, Syracuse has had some struggles, and they went on a four game winning streak after losing two in a row but have since lost to Georgia Tech. You and I have not discussed this game. The game happened on Saturday. So ultimately, you know, Syracuse just, they allowed four score, four out of the five starters for Georgia Tech got in double digits. Haywood had 15, Alvarado had 19, uh, Gway had 10, and Banks, the third, had 16 in this game. On Syracuse's side of it, Syracuse had three starters in double figures, O'Shea Brissett, Elijah Hughes, and Tyus Battle. Tyus Battle's numbers have gone down. Now, obviously, they can spread the ball around, and they can do some interesting things with that, you know, so he doesn't have to take 20 shots a game, but his shooting has really not gone that well. He was only 3 for 12 on the night in this matchup. End of the game with 11 points in 34 minutes, so definitely having some struggles. Tyus Battle is on the offensive side. He's had some good games. He had a good game against Ohio State, and, and obviously, you know, had a nice uh, last-second shot in, you know, recently here. But ultimately, you know, we're, we're looking when, when they played up against Georgetown, he had a hell of a game on his jumper that he had. But consistently, we haven't seen Tyus Battle be an offensive threat. And, you know, O'Shea Brissett's done some good things, but his rebounds are more quiet. Elijah Hughes has been able to put some stuff together and has really stepped up. Uh, Marek Dolajai had six rebounds in this loss, three assists, five steals, and four points. So he's been their utility belt, which has been huge. Uh, Frank Howard was quiet, had eight points in this game, had three assists, two rebounds, two steals, three turnovers in the game. Uh, Barama Sidibe did not score. Pascal Chuku and Jalen Carey, none of them scored. Uh, the only scorer off the bench for the team was Buddy Beheim, who had nine. He outscored Georgia Tech's bench, who had three bench players come out, but only Cole scored with eight. So between Beheim and Cole, the benches of Syracuse and Georgia Tech, Buddy Beheim outscored Georgia Tech's bench by himself. But it was the starters for Georgia Tech and, and just, you know, ultimately how this this game went for Syracuse, who lost by almost 20 points in the game. So, I mean, that's it's it's just a it's a it's a tough situation for Syracuse to be in at this point, being at 11 and five and kind of going up and down and around the corner in this one and just not not getting it done. Again, they took numerous shots from the outside. Here's an interesting thing about Syracuse's shot chart. They missed every single shot they took from the left elbow. So from the left side of the three-point line, they missed every single shot they took. They ended up taking 11 shots from the left elbow. They missed every single one of them. From the corner, they made two of five from the left corner of the three-point line. From the right corner, they made two of three. Then they made one from the right elbow, maybe two from the right elbow. One was far away, so let's say two from the right elbow. They didn't really shoot any from the top of the key. But most of their shots that they made came inside of the paint, obviously. I'm looking, though, I'm looking right here because there's two things that I'm thinking when I'm looking at the shot chart. The first one is that Syracuse takes way too many threes, but that's like an every year thing. The second part of it is that Syracuse took 11 threes from the left elbow and missed every single one of them. Every single one of them. When you look at the the left and the right elbow, they made two of their threes. They missed 18 and made two from the left and right elbow. Missed 18, made two. Two for 20. 10%. But they keep shooting them. They keep shooting them. They don't take enough shots in the paint. They don't take enough chances inside. But they're shooting like crazy on the outside. And, I mean, I understand when you're down later on in the game, but they shoot threes all the time. They shoot threes all game long. And that's the frustration. Is that this Syracuse team feels like they got to shoot threes all day, every day. And it doesn't work out. 
They went seven for 33 from three-point range. You know how many threes Georgia Tech took? Twelve. Georgia Tech went six of 12 from three. Syracuse went seven for 33. So Georgia Tech made one less three-pointer, but took nine. But they made, they made one less three-pointer, took 21 less three-point shots, though. So they take 21 less attempts for three-point and made six. Syracuse takes 21 more than Georgia Tech and makes seven. So out of the 21 more attempts, Syracuse only had one more three than Georgia Tech. They feel the need to shoot, though. 33 of Syracuse's field goal attempts from three-point range. Guess how many were from inside of the arc? 24. They took less shots closer to the basket than they did away from the basket. Georgia Tech had 30 attempts inside the arc, 12 outside the arc. That's how it should be. That's how it should be. Well, Dan, they can't rely on Pascal Chuku. I get that. I understand that. Well, they can't rely on Barama Sidibe for a ton of offense. Well, I think Barama can do more than people give him credit for. Well, Marek Dolajai doesn't have a big body. Okay. But Tyus Battle can't drive the lane. Elijah Hughes can't drive the lane. Jalen Carey can't drive the lane. Frank Howard can't drive the lane. O'Shea Brissett can't drive the lane. Why? Why are they taking these threes? The live by the three, die by the three has been going on at Syracuse for the majority of my life. In the time that I've watched Syracuse play that sport they call basketball, this is what I see. And they got to get away from it. Number one, they don't have somebody that can consistently make threes. So why they're shooting them is beyond me. They're going to have to take the time to figure out where they need to go with the ball, how they need to go with the ball, and who the ball needs to go to. Because in the here and now, this isn't working. In the here and now, this is not something that's worked for years. You don't have Jerry McNamara on the team. You don't have Preston Shumpert on the team. It's not working. And it's not something that you could just rely on and say, you know what? I mean, what's the definition of insanity? Over and over, Doing something over and over again, expecting a different result. And that's what Syracuse is doing. They're consistently taking threes. For what reason? They don't make them. Alvarado had a day inside. 19 points in 38 minutes. So scored once every two minutes. Five for six from the field. Three for three from three point. He did what he needed to do inside and outside. He did what he needed to do. Alvarado had a day. 19 points in 38 minutes. Three for three from three point. Made a couple inside. Six for seven at the line. The guard did well. Banks, six for ten. 16 points. All inside play. Seven rebounds in the game. Three blocks in the game. Three steals in the game. Marek Dolajai, again, he's your utility belt. He's all over the place. But the offense has been quiet outside of that. And speaking on Syracuse basketball, we have the man Otis Hill on the broadcast with us now, and we're going to bring him in here to talk about Syracuse's season so far. Otis, it's been a while. How are we doing today? Hey, damn good. How are you? Doing very well. So what's first and foremost, what's been going on? Catch us up on your life. What's, what's going on in Otis Hill's world right now? Oh, well, you know, a lot of, a lot of different things going on right now. Still working at the, uh, detention center with, uh, at risk juveniles. Uh, the wife, I had to go down south for a new job. So we're dealing with that. But other than that, just, you know, being me, (laughs) just being me. And, and Otis, have you, have you had the time to really sit down? I know that you pay close attention to this team over the years. Have you been able to, to catch up with them and, and see how this season's gone so far? Yeah, I watched, I watched a few Q's games, you know, working upstate New York, you know, there's a lot of Syracuse fans, so most of the time Syracuse is playing, either they turn it on for me or they just watch, so I've watched the team a lot this year. 
And what are you seeing from this team? They're eleven and five at the time that we're sitting here talking, and you know they they've had ups and downs. And you know I was discussing the fact that they like to live and die by the three, which is something that's been kind of an mo for a while here. But what have you taken away from the team this season? Well, I think I think a lot of people are comparing them to other Syracuse teams, and I never think that's fair. You know, I think they're their own team within themselves. They got they got good points and bad points, just like every other team. Um, of course, I'm old school, so of course they're shooting too many threes, but that's the way the game has evolved. So, you know, to keep up with teams like Duke and Kansas, who do shoot the three ball a lot, I think a lot of these, a lot of players feel that they have to shoot the three. But my thing, my biggest thing is let's have a high percentage if we're going to shoot that three ball. And when you look at it, like I was mentioning, this loss to Georgia Tech, they lose 73-59. to They shoot 11 threes from the left elbow. None of them go in. Seven of 33 from three-point range. And they shot more threes in this game than, than they took shots inside. I mean, when you hear stats like that and information like that, I mean, what – what are your takeaways from that? Knowing that they're taking more attempts inside or outside of the arc than they're taking inside, and and going seven of thirty three, but just continuing to you know kind of do the definition of insanity and keep shooting them. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, times have changed so much. You know, when I came in, I shot threes from high school, and I can remember Bayham sitting me down and telling me, "You shoot one more three, you'll never see that court again." <laughs> so. <laughs> For me, it's, it's times have changed. Now, as a player, I, I miss the mid range. You know, the mid range is a lost art. It really is. And you watch teams like San Antonio who still shoot the mid range. Uh, certain NBA guys who still shoot the mid range. It can be an effective weapon. And I think what guys feel like, oh, we need a three, we need a three to get the head, get ahead. And they watch guys like Steph Curry and, and all these great three point shooters. But I think guys don't realize what these guys do to shoot such a high percentage. You know, I've watched Steph on TV and I've talked to people. He sits in the gym three, four hours, you know, and just constantly works on his craft. And I think these guys got to understand it's not, you're not just taking a shot. You're taking a shot to make it, you know, and to, and to be that good from that range, you really got to put in the time and work. And, and I think what happens is guys get lost in that. They can make the shot, but they're not making it right now. They got to go to the bread and butter, which is a inside bucket. And when you see the inside play, speaking here with Otis Hill, former inside man for Syracuse, when you look at Barama Sidibe and Marek Dolajai, I mean, really, Pascal Chukwu is, has been kind of the forgotten man on the bench right now after, you know, upsetting Bayheim. you know, in the beginning here. He wanted to see some more consistency, and he didn't see it, so we're not seeing Pascal Chukwu. What do you think about Barama and, and Marek? Because, I mean, you know, you you were a big body guy. I mean, you had the muscle. You could you could take ch- you know take charge inside. You know, it was kind of like when you were playing, you had to be a lineman essentially. Where if you took Barama and Marek and put their bodies together, they probably don't have what you were as a presence inside. So, what's that doing for for this team, in your opinion? I think it hurts. I think it hurts a lot not having a big guy who can bang in each face. But like I said, the game is changing and evolving. When I watch games with guys who played in my era, the first thing we talk about is how athletic everybody is now. And to me, you know, I, it's just my opinion, but I feel like a lot of these guys now are more athletic and they, they, they're away from the fundamentals. You know, you got seven-foot guards coming out now. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. Everybody wants to be KD, but you can't be KD. You got to get, get in where you fit in, so to speak. So for me, the two big guys, I think the biggest thing for them is they have to show coaches they can go in there and produce. And when they don't, coach kind of doesn't have a choice but to go small or interchange. So I I just wish those guys could get a little bit more consistent and maybe get some touches in the paint, get some confidence and score a little bit inside because I know how tough it is being a big man at Syracuse. You're kind of the, the forgotten guy. Now, Marek Dolezal has been put into the starting lineup with Pascal being taken out of the starting lineup. And, and, you know, Pascal had 15 minutes in this game, did not attempt a single shot. He had five rebounds. He had three blocks in the game. I mean, he's in there to be around the rim and block shots and, and get rebounds and whatnot. But, you know, offensively, Marek Dolezal, he's the, by, you know, I, I guess the definition of it all, he's the 
he's the starter as far as the center goes, even though he's a forward. I asked him about his comfort level a couple games ago when when Jim Beheim was talking about moving him to that starting role in that center position, and he said, I'm not comfortable in it. You know, he's like, I got to get in the gym. I got to put on more weight, but he likes to shoot. He works on his shot. You know, he could shoot threes a game ago. He made a couple threes against Clemson, you know, but he's a utility belt guy. He's rebounds, he's assists, he's steals, he's blocks, and he gets a few points. What do you think about the Marek Dolajai situation that he's in the starting lineup kind of as the center, but he's really not a center, and he's doing a lot of great things, but Jim needs him to step up inside. I mean, what what are you taking away from a forward being in a center position that probably weighs 90 pounds soaking wet, but he's a really good utility guy? Well, him being a utility guy, the thing I like about him is, you're right, he's a utility guy, and when you have someone like that, they can be very, very useful. He's got to understand that, yes, he may be, he might be outweighed by a lot of centers. He may be smaller than a lot of centers, but that's just been the Syracuse way for years. He can use that to his to his advantage, and I think once he realizes that, he can be a force because the way you said he shoots threes, he can get some rebounds, he can get steals. That can be magnified by him playing a bigger, slower guy. You know, a lot of guys going like me. I was the smallest center for years <laughs> when I played. I was the smallest center. But you got to use it. You know, I did get stronger. I still had a little bit of quickness. You got to be smart. You got to use all your positives and turn them into your advantages. Because a lot of guys are going to say, oh, he's small, he's skinny, I can get him. No, I'm going to use my quickness to get around you and foul you out. You know, he's just got to be confident and realize what he can do. Yeah, and Marek Dolajai, you know, for our, I mean, he has been the guy that, that has helped Syracuse to move forward. I mean, he has done a lot of good things. And it doesn't always show up in in the stat sheet as it, it you know it doesn't show up as a double double or anything. But what he is doing is being involved all over the place. Where have you? Where do you feel like there is the lack? Because Marek's trying to do everything. Who is a guy that you maybe want to see step up more? I mean, Frank Howard, Tyus Battle, O'Shea Brissett. The team leaned on them heavily last year. In this game to Georgia Tech, Frank had eight points. Tyus had 11 in 34 minutes. O'Shea had 15. None of them shot well. So, I mean, what what are you seeing from those guys? Well, it's tough sometimes. When, you know, when, when the team relies on three people to score sometimes, they need other guys to step up. And, I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is. And it's hard, and I understand that guys may not be getting the touches, but if you show coach, when you get in, you got to make the most of your minutes, whether it's two, whether it's three. Whether it's 30 seconds, if you come in and do something positive, Beheim will put you in. He has to have that trust in you. And when he doesn't have that trust, everybody knows he's going to go to the seven, the seven guys that he feels he can trust. I feel like a lot of the bench guys, they may take it as a negative. You know, when, when he used to sit me on the bench and J.B. Reesnott and I were both centers, he taught me in my head to use it to propel yourself. Use it to push you. When I take you out, Take it as, oh, I need you to play better. So I'm going to put him in until you get your mind right and play better. And I think a lot of guys nowadays, they don't look at the situation like that. And I think if those guys do look at it like that and they really see what they can do, take what they can do and put it out on the court and be consistent. And when we look at Tyus Battle, I mean, he made the decision, speaking here with Otis Hill of Syracuse Orange Men's Basketball History, on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, we, you know, when when the decision was made by Tyus to stay, you know, I talked to him at the beginning of the season at Media Day about the NBA, and he was a little kid, and his eyes lit up, and, you know, he wants it, and he dreams about it, and he did, you know, I, one thing I do like about the NBA with the NCAA is that they allow you to go out there and not hire an agent and still be able to go to the combine and, and, and do a workout and have teams be around you and see what you're made of and get information and get advice. So I think it's great. But Tyus Battle this year outside of Georgia Tech's – or the outside of the Georgetown part of me, his last second shot and the way he played against Ohio State, it's been rather underwhelming. What are your thoughts on Tyus Battle? Because he's not shooting well. He's not taking over. In 16 games, he's taken over maybe two of them that have mattered in the grand scheme of things. Syracuse's two biggest wins are Ohio State and Georgetown. 
So outside of that, we're not really seeing the Tyus battle that, you know, people expect to see when they pay for that ticket. So what are your thoughts? I think it's tough for him. You know, I feel for the guy. I can remember when uh, John was – John was talking about leaving early. It's, it's a lot of pressure to, to come back to a school and, and try to win a championship. I think that's what every college player who comes back to school wants to achieve. And I think what happened was everything was placed on him because he had such a, uh, such a successful season the year before. I think everything was placed on him. And sometimes maybe he's trying to do too much or sometimes teams are keying on him. It's a tough situation for Tyus. I, I know... I know he wants to win. I know he bleeds orange from what I see. And I just wish he could have a little bit more help because it's tough out there when you're, when you're the main, when you're the main guy and everybody's got that target on your back because you're the guy that they have to stop. And being, I mean, like you said, you feel for him because, you know, he's the guy that people are keying in on. He's the guy that people have to stop. But we've seen him take over. We've seen him find a way. I mean, especially when games matter the most in tournament time. So, you know, when you see him play, are you seeing a are you seeing a, a a different? Are you seeing a lack of swagger out there? Are you seeing a frustration when you're watching the game? What are you seeing from him? Does he look different? Does it feel different? Because watching these games for me, it's it, I mean, there's games that I've been at the dome this season where, and this is no offense to Tyus, I respect the heck out of him. I forgot he was out there on the floor because he was not utilized for. I mean, they're tw- 10, 12, 4, I mean, the majority of the game, he didn't have to do a thing, which is, I guess, good to say about guys like Elijah Hughes and O'Shea Brissett and whatnot, but there have been moments where you kind of forget that Tyus is even out there at times. Yeah, that, 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 I've, I've um, you know, I hate to say that too. I've seen that too in a couple of games. But I think also what happens is teams play him differently on defense now. You know, they know him. They studied him. They know his 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 comfort zones. They know the the things, the little ticks he likes to do. The scouting now for college is is ridiculous. You know, they watch guys how they take steps and what little hitches they like to do in their shots. I mean, teams are really studying him and breaking him down, and that's what he has to expect coming back because he had such a phenomenal year last year. And he's a great player. I think teams just really started to break his game down and diagnose him, and then. They've been playing really decent defense. And I also think for him, being a player, it's frustrating sometimes. You know, you're trying to do the right things. You're trying to do this. You're trying to do that. And it's just not clicking. And hopefully, they, you know, they're getting clicking. they still got a lot of basketball left. There's a lot of basketball left. So I'll never count my orange out. And I think Tyus will regain that 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 swagger and that, that, that uh, sense of accomplishment that he had last year. That coming from Otis Hill, former Syracuse player, here with us on Wake Up Call with Dan Satora. Otis, uh, not to not to beat the point any deeper, but just to kind of round out this point before I get to something else. Syracuse has attempted this season 379 threes. They've made 112 of them, which puts them in a position of stating the fact that they are 29.5% effective at shooting three-point shots, 112 made, 379 attempted. If you were on the team right now and you were an assistant coach, what would you be saying? Fellas, we got to look. We got to look. We got to look away from the long ball a little bit. Unless we're clicking, I'm not telling them not to shoot it, but we're putting ourselves in holes. These guys are hitting twos. We're taking threes and missing three threes in a row. They just got six points. You know, I think I think you got to get back to the basics. Listen. You know, and, I, and I really understand how frustrating it is for coach because I watch high school teams and they're doing the same thing. So it's like you got to get into their head. Listen, if we're not clicking from the three, we got to get some easy twos. You know, the three ball has become a weapon, but it also could be a hindrance as we're talking about with Syracuse. Is it something that, I mean, it, does it just say, you know, what the game is now? I mean, are we essentially – you know, not just with Syracuse. I mean, Syracuse, it's been their M.O. for a while that they like to chuck up the threes. But, you know, are, are we seeing this in general, in your opinion, speaking here with Otis Hill, 
you know, with with basketball because of the fact that we've gone away from the inside big man and the physicality of the game and everything is a foul now and big men want to shoot threes and everybody wants to be on the highlight reel and like you said you brought up the Kevin Durant you know conversation where people want to want to you want to be the big man but you want to be able to shoot all over uh, you know are, are we seeing more threes in the game and, and less of that inside presence because of the fact that the game has essentially been changing in your opinion I, yes, I definitely think so. I, I've been watching games where the big man is non-existent, and, and, and it hurts. <laughs> you know, being a former big man, when you look out there, you got some guys that are talented. Um, Giannis Antetokounmpo from uh, Milwaukee is one guy I'll use an example of. He has become a point forward. Not a great shooter, amazing scorer, great talent. But he's had to change his game and develop his game almost into a guard because that's the way the game's going. I haven't seen, I honestly have not seen a post play in college in the longest time. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's crazy to me because now if the small ball has really taken over because now it's a bunch of guards and maybe one big guy who's just out there to rebound and defend. And it, it just, it's like the big man is, is, is a dinosaur now. And that's the crazy part of it. Like, I mean, with you inside, you know, you were asked to score. You were asked to get after it. You were asked to be effective. They were dumping the ball inside. It. And now, you know, even when we look at Pascal Chuku, the tallest guy on the team, seven foot two, you know, he's asked to block shots to get rebounds. And 15 minutes doesn't attempt a single shot, you know. And, and that's, I mean, that even like an offensive rebound and just putting the ball back up type of situation. So, you know, we are seeing a change here. But overall, with Syracuse, you know, what do you like? Are there positives you are taking away at this point? Are there things that are standing out to you? The team is 11-5. and five. They have defeated one ranked team, but that team isn't ranked anymore. So are you seeing promise? Are you seeing some parts of the team that are sticking out to you in a positive way? Or are you still looking for that moment at this point? I think there's always some positives. You look at certain guys and you take away what they've done. You can see a lot of positive things going just as a team. You know, I think they share the ball pretty well. I think they defend a lot better than we give them credit for. I mean, Georgia Tech was a little bit, a little bit of a miscue because they shot so many threes and got behind. But I think overall, I think they're a solid team. They just have to start clicking. And whether that's uh, Tyus Battle getting in, scoring twenty three, or guys from the bench adding ten, eight points. I think collectively they haven't come together as a whole. And I don't know what's going to make that happen. But I think collectively, when they come together as a team, I think they'll be a lot better than what we're seeing right now at this point. And let's be honest, 11-5 and five is not that bad. <laughs> right. You know, it's just the fact that, you know, they're, if they, if the and I said this earlier on in today's show here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, I made mention of Syracuse's two key victories that the committee would look at or against Ohio State at Ohio State where they defeated a top 10 team or top uh, 25 team and then the win over Georgetown. However, Ohio State and Georgetown at the time we're talking both have a bunch of losses and they both are not ranked in the top 25. So if the committee had to look at Syracuse right now, I don't see how they put them in unless it was one of those last second things. So you know, in your mind, Syracuse's resume, they're 11-5. and five. Their best wins are against teams not ranked in the top 25 that are named Georgetown and Ohio State. So, you know, where does that put them in the grand scheme of things? Because in my opinion, they're going to have to kill it in the ACC if they got a shot. What do you think? I agree. I think we got to get some big ones in the ACC. You know, ACC is tough, but you got so many other conferences out there. Guys are getting key wins. Like you said, Georgetown and Ohio State were – big wins, but when you look at it, as the season goes on, both of those teams dropped out in the top 20. So now, as Syracuse, if I, and we know how the committee can be sometimes, they have to have some key signature wins if they want to get in, or even if they want to play side. So, you're right, they are going to have to tear it up in ACC, but it's conference play, baby. That's where the fun happens. Absolutely, and, and I gotta ask you this, because there, there's a little conundrum that came into my mind, but I've, I've been voicing it more lately. Uh, speaking here with Otis Hill, Syracuse Orange men's basketball alum, 
Sarah, I'm going to ask you this because I want to have the conversation, but I want to see if, if you feel the same way first. Who do you think is Syracuse's biggest rival in the ACC? Ooh, that's tough. I, see, for me, I, I, I just – Duke. I, I got to say Duke. Okay. Me. Who is Duke's biggest rival in the ACC? See, that's tough. <laughs> see, I would say Duke and Carolina. Okay. So – when Syracuse was in the Big East, who was Syracuse's biggest rival? Georgetown. Okay. And who was Georgetown's biggest rival? Syracuse. Okay. So you see the conundrum. Syracuse's biggest rival in the Big East was Georgetown. Georgetown's biggest rival was Syracuse. In the ACC, Syracuse's biggest rival is Duke. Duke's biggest rival is North Carolina. North Carolina's biggest rival is Duke. So how do you have a true feel of the conference and a true rivalry when your biggest rival is not is not their biggest rival, right? It's kind. Of, it's and it's. I see it. It's always been that thing because I know a lot of guys from Duke, and it's always been that you know Syracuse. I got to catch up to us. That type of mentality, and and, and I, you know, no offense to Coach Stefanski or any of those guys. I hated Duke. <laughs> I couldn't stand them. They were a great team. They always won. And I think as Syracuse plays them, you know, that's all they hear about. Oh, you guys got to play Duke. You got to play Duke. So it kind of forced Syracuse to kind of have that rivalry. You know, you want to beat the best. And right now, we're not the best right now. And we got to get there. You know, Duke, Duke's a great team, but they're vulnerable just like any other team. Yeah, and that's the, that's the situation is that, you know, Syracuse has played Duke twice this season. But, you know, again, you know, it's, it's, it's that reality that Syracuse's biggest rival is, is Duke and Duke's biggest rival is North Carolina. So, it takes away a little bit, and it's good to have the Georgetown game, but, you know, how how strange is it? I know we've talked about it before, Otis, but how strange is it for you to, you know, you, you see the Georgetown rivalry, and it's exciting, but the Georgetown rivalry with Syracuse that's continued, it happens in, it happens in December. It happens in late November. It doesn't happen in January, February. It doesn't happen in the Garden in March. You know, I mean, it, it takes a toll that Syracuse doesn't have a true rival in the ACC. You're right. It, it, it's it's all, I think it is all due to that, getting used to that new conference. You know, it, it, it kind of hurt to see my alma mater go to the ACC when it first happened. You know, I understand business and it's just, just the way it goes. But when I first heard about it, oh, it hurt my heart because I, I remember so many battles in the garden. You know, Big East tournament. Now I watched the Big East tournament last year, and I just I, I had to turn it off <laughs> because I didn't see us in Connecticut and Georgia. I mean, it just wasn't that same feel. And you know, we're still getting used to the ACC, which is kind of crazy. But you're right; it does take away a lot from the old rivalry and the and the magic that the Big East used to have. And coming from Otis Hill, right here. On Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. Otis, uh, final words here. I know we'll, we'll be talking again soon, but final thoughts here. If you were in the locker room with Syracuse today, what would be your words to Syracuse? Ah, see, Dan, I'm getting old now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm 44 years old, and I can't be that guy that I was, you know, screaming and getting in guys' faces. Now it, it, it's more on the therapeutic <laughs> therapeutic way and I would just I would just try to boost their confidence and have them go out like some crazed dogs because what do you have to lose if you put everything out on that floor and you guys click together and play as a team what do you have to lose and I would just try to rile them and rather you know rally the troops and get them going you know and I'm sure coach is doing that and I'm sure all the assistants and everybody's trying to get them together and for me I'd probably curse a lot <laughs> <laughs> You know, but the biggest thing is to go out there and leave everything out and play with heart. You know, you got to be tough. You got to be tough in the sport. Absolutely, and you know, and they're missing. They're missing that toughness. They're missing that inside presence that they once had. So, Otis, I know you just said you're 44, but you know, maybe just maybe you should think about maybe lacing them up again. <laughs> Listen, if I can play half court, I definitely do it. <laughs> <laughs> So that's all we need to do. We just got to have you cherry picking on the other side. That's all we need. These young boys are running like deer. I watched. I watched something the other day with a seven foot point guard. I. I mean, the game is getting ridiculous. 
it's just, it's crazy how talented and skilled these guys are getting. It is. It, it's it's insane where we're at right now, but it's it's what's going down and it's it's how things are and you know the game has obviously changed a little bit. You are right though; they are running like deer. But Otis Hill, nothing but the uh, but tremendous respect for Mr. Otis Hill, and uh, always appreciate having you on the show. It's been too long, Otis. So. You know that you and I have good times together, so hopefully you missed me a little bit in the rest of 2018. You know, definitely, did. definitely did. And uh, we'll make sure that we keep in touch and and continue the conversation. Definitely, Dan. Good to talk to you. All right, take care. Have a good day. You too. All right, bye. Bye-bye. That coming from Otis Hill once again, and I had the opportunity to speak here with Otis today is a great opportunity as always. Let's take a step aside. We'll be back in just a moment. This is a wake-up call, Fast Break. Get Hilton quality service at the most affordable price at True by Hilton Camillus, located right next to Costco in Township 5. True by Hilton Camillus offers you their signature Top It breakfast bar with over 30 different toppings to personalize the most important meal of the day, all complimentary with your stay. For reservations and information, call 315-314-8676. That's 315-314-8676. True by Hilton Camillus. Hilton quality service at the most affordable price. Having peace of mind when you're out of town, that your furry loving friend is safe and sound, means taking them to Canine Campground. Because we all know that when it comes to the love of our pets, it goes well beyond the call of duty to make sure they're safe and sound. Right, Lily? (laughs) So take a ride to 242 Johnson Street in East Syracuse, New York, and see Canine Campground and where your dog will be staying. In the classic cabin, the executive cabin, the grand cabin, or of course, the luxury cabin. Because if you know Lily, you know she loves luxury. (laughs) Now you don't have to wait to the last minute to find a family member or a friend that'll take your dog for a few days. Call Canine Campground at 315-299-4013. That's 315-299-4013. Their drop-off and pick-up times are Monday through Sunday. Check K9Campground.com for more information. That's the letter K, the number 9, and campground spelled with a K, dot com. K9Campground.com. When you're going out of town, bring your dog to Canine Campground. Consistency is, well, consistently hard to find. Unless you head to 119 East 2nd Street in East Syracuse, New York, the home of the Penn and Trophy Center, who has been serving us central and upstate New Yorkers, as well as beyond, for decades. The Penn and Trophy Center on 119 East 2nd Street in East Syracuse, New York, gives you an amazing and unique way to customize a memory today. Say it with the Penn and Trophy Center. Be it an Employee of the Month award, a sports award, something for your business, engraving for your family, your loved ones, anniversaries, birthday parties, and so much more, including remembering somebody who served in the military. Say it with the Penn and Trophy Center. 119 East 2nd Street in East Syracuse, New York. The definition of consistency is Penn and Trophy. Browse their products on penandtrophy.com. That's penandtrophy.com. And call them for more information at 315-422-8797. That's 315-422-8797. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is located on 3680 Milton Avenue, in the Home Depot Plaza. It is your family-friendly sports bar and restaurant. Folks, some sports bars aren't family-friendly. Some family-friendly restaurants are not sports bars. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is proud to be both. It is that marriage that you've been looking for for years. The Wildcat Sports Pub is your home base for your sports bar and restaurant needs, games for the kids, indoor and outdoor activities, and enough things on the menu to come back every single week and get to try something new. They're open Sundays from noon to 8 p.m., Monday through Wednesday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Thursday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to midnight. For reservations and party information, call 315 315- 
487-2222 for the Wildcat family-friendly sports pub and restaurant. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Went a few minutes past today, but that's, you know what, under promise, over deliver. We wanted to give you some time here with Otis Hill, and we couldn't get Otis at the top of the hour, and he had to, you know, a little change in his schedule, had to get back to us later on in the broadcast. We want to make sure we got to Otis. So I want to thank Otis for being a part of the show. Roosevelt Bowie Jr., we're looking to have him on later on this week. On Tuesday's broadcast, Tuesday, January 15th, we're going to have Sonny Spira, John Wallace, and Gene Waldron, a trio of Syracuse Orange men's basketball alumni, coming on to the show to speak on their opinion of Syracuse this season. Straight off the game against Duke, will be joined on Tuesday, January 19th, or January 15th, pardon me, at 9 a.m. by Sonny Spira live to speak on the Syracuse Orange. And then at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, John Wallace will join us. And at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, we'll be joined by Gene Waldron, all before the ingredients to success. Proudly brought to you by Utica Pizza Company, and it's a Utica thing to round out the show every Tuesday at 10.50 a.m. Eastern Time. So a trio of Syracuse alumni and the ingredients to success all coming to you live this Tuesday, tomorrow for those of you listening live, Tuesday, January 15th between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Thank you so much to Otis Hill for being a part of the show today, and we also look forward to having all of our wonderful segments I spoke on uh, earlier in the show, as well as having Marvin Graves, who is our Monday morning quarterback, who is actually going through an MRI today. So say a little prayer for, for Marvin Graves. We'll be talking with him later on this week. And we are excited to do that. So we'll have our Monday morning quarterback a little bit later this week. And obviously we'll be joined by Syracuse Orange men's basketball alumni, Coach Q and Papa Joe, as well as fantasy football talk with Mike Sofka and so much more coming up here on the broadcast. Daywan Coleman will also be a part of the show this week, a member of the Syracuse Stallions and obviously a former Syracuse Orange men's basketball player as well. So plenty coming up on Wake Up Call with Dan Satora. Can't wait to share that time with you, and thank you so much for tuning in. Congratulations to the Syracuse Stallions for winning a close one in their game last night at ITC. They played a home game at ITC instead of Manlius Pebble Hill in yesterday's game, and they were able to get that victory, which has now sent them into a 13-0 and situation. They're now 13-0 and in their first season in existence. Syracuse has pro basketball again, and that's with the ABA's Syracuse Stallions, who are now 13-0. and Their next game is going to be on January 19th, Syracuse at Binghamton at 7.05 p.m., and on January 20th, they're back at home against Wyoming Valley, and they'll round out January at home against Pottstown at, on January 26th. So two home games coming up in January, and a game that's only an hour away against Binghamton, all coming up for the Syracuse Stallions after having a full schedule in February and a couple games in March as they get set in their hopes for the road to St. Louis and the opportunity of getting after a national championship in just their first season in existence. So shout out to the Syracuse Stallions. You can buy your tickets by going to SyracuseStallions.com. And shout out to Chris Gilks and the team once again for defeating the Elmira Eagles in their game that they had over the weekend on Sunday, January 13th. Big ups to the team for gutting it out. They were up by 30 at the break and the game got closer in the fourth quarter. Some good shooting going on with the Elmira Eagles and the Syracuse Stallions were able to withstand that. So Big shout-out to the team, and a congratulations to the Stallions for getting the job done. Their rivalry with Binghamton is a good one, and they've gotten the best of Binghamton in their two rivalry games they've had against them so far, 132-124 to at home, and on the road, 115-103. to They will face off against Binghamton on the road once again, January 19th, coming up here, Syracuse at Binghamton at 7.05 p.m. Eastern Time, and that game on January 19th will take place on this coming Saturday, and then they'll be home on Sunday the 20th against Wyoming Valley once again. You can buy your tickets by going to SyracuseStallions.com for the away and for the home game, so make sure you do that. Thank you to Monster Energy for fueling the show, and thank you for your energy and your positivity and your appreciation for helping to fuel us as well. We look forward to talking with you all week. Syracuse taking on Duke tonight in a big-time game. Duke could win this game by 30, or it could be a close one. Syracuse plays up for these games, so I think it's going to be a closely contested one. I won't be surprised if Syracuse wins this game. 
and I can't wait to watch it and talk about it with you tomorrow morning, as well as Sonny Spira, John Wallace, and Gene Waldron. God bless. Have a great day. Take care of yourself. And remember, your dreams matter, you matter, and life is meant to be enjoyed. So go out and give it your all, and have a great day, folks. Be good.